Well, welcome everybody to part two of our baseball presentation. In this one, we'll look at uh, the years 1920 to the World War II era. And uh, we'll look at some of the players that were instrumental in increasing baseball's popularity during this time and making it truly America's pastime. Of course, the first player you have to start with is a guy who started his career during the dead ball era and did so mainly as a pitcher and uh, made a name for himself as a pitcher during that time. And then the uh, home run became his signature and the live ball era was underway with George Herman Babe Ruth. You can see he played from 1914 to 1935 over 20 seasons. He played for the Red Sox for the first handful of years and helped them win three World Series. He was a star pitcher on those Red Sox teams and uh, was one of the greatest pitchers in the game during that time. And then after the 1919 season, the Red Sox owner was hard up for cash. In fact, the owner uh, was into the theater and, and producing plays and funding uh, theatrical productions and so he needed money and this Red Sox owner would oftentimes sell his best players to other major league teams so he could get the money to finance his theatrical productions and so in 1919 he sold Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees and that move goes down as uh, one of the biggest bonehead moves by an by a sports owner in history, of course. After uh, the Red Sox sold Babe Ruth, of course, they did not win another World Series until 2004. And so the curse, as it was called, of the Bambino uh, loomed over the Red Sox for a long time, many decades. Meanwhile, the Yankees, who never won a World Series before Babe Ruth got there, uh, have gone on to win 27. World Series since 1920 and have been the most dominant franchise in Major League Baseball since then. You can see he played for the Yankees throughout the 20s to the mid 30s and then for the Boston Braves for his last season in 1935. He has as many nicknames as anyone ever has in baseball, the Bambino, the Sultan of Swat, the Colossus of Clout, and a handful of others. But it wasn't just the home run that Babe Ruth specialized at when he became a full-time hitter. After the Yankees got him, they could have easily kept him on the mound and let him hit as well, uh, but they decided to put him in the outfield and make him a full-time outfielder position player. And the legend of Babe Ruth really, really took off at that time. Uh, but like I said, he wasn't only a home run hitter. You can see a 342 career average, with his, which is 10th all time in Major League history. Uh, his 714 home runs was a record that stood for many, many years, of course, until, uh, until it was broken by Hank Aaron. Babe Ruth would often hit more home runs in a season than entire teams hit in the early days of the what they called the live ball era, which basically started in 1920, uh, the year Ruth went to the Yankees. You can see he's still second all-time in RBI, next only to Hank Aaron. He's tied for fourth in runs scored, and he's third all-time in walks. Babe Ruth was an all-around devastating, dominating offensive player, the most dominant compared to his era that we've ever seen in baseball. You can see there under his uh, career uh, hitting stats, he had a 94 and 46 career pitching record with a 2.28 ERA. That's why I say he was one of the greatest pitchers in baseball during his time with the Red Sox. 12 times he led the American League in home runs. And uh, like I said, he, he had helped the Red Sox win three World Series in his time there, and then he won four more with the Yankees. He was an MVP in 1923, and the Yankees retired his number three jersey, of course, and uh, named to the Major League Baseball All-Century team and All-Time team. He was also one of the first five players inducted in the inaugural Hall of Fame class in 1936. You can see his records there off to the right. 
slugging percentage, uh, on base plus slugging. Uh, and in 1921, 119 extra base hits, 177 runs, 457 total bases. Those are all major league records. Now keep in mind, back then the season was 154 games, not 162. So today our seasons are eight games longer than in the old days. You can also see he led the league in home runs 12 times, which is a record in slugging percentage 13 times, on base plus slugging 13 times, runs scored eight times, and RBI six times. These are offensive records that just are mind-blowing, and uh, he was, of course, he, he was the ticket uh, that people came to see. He was the guy that, uh, that really caused the Yankees to build their own new stadium uh, not long after he got there, and they called it the house that Ruth built, Yankee Stadium, the house that Ruth built because of uh, the sellout crowds that would come to watch him. And the owner was, uh, was rolling in the cash after Babe Ruth uh, brought those crowds to see him hit home runs and put on offensive displays like no one had ever seen. So, of course, Babe Ruth is still the most famous baseball player of all time and may be the most famous player of all time forever. There's some pictures of the babe. In the upper left is a young man with the Red Sox. On the far right, as a much older player with the Yankees. And then on the bottom left, for Babe Ruth Day at Yankee Stadium, uh, when his career was, was uh, basically over. Uh, but the legend has continued. Rogers Hornsby was a magician with a bat in his hands. Hornsby played for the St. Louis Cardinals uh, for much of his career. He helped the Cardinals win a World Series in 1926, and uh, and he had to battle the great Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig-led Yankees during that time. His lifetime average of 358 is second all-time, uh, next only to Ty Cobb. He registered 2,930 career hits, 301 home runs. And you can see 1,584 career RBI. He was twice the National League MVP and was twice a Triple Crown winner in the National League as well. A Triple Crown winner uh, for an offensive player means that they lead the league for that year in home runs, RBI, and batting average. And you can see he batted 400 or better three times in his career, including a 424 clip in 1924. He's still the only player to hit 40 home runs and bat 400 in the same season. And you can see that 1922 year was off the charts. He won seven National League batting titles, including six in a row, and he led the National League in slugging nine times, which is still a record. He was an all-around offensive player and quite possibly the greatest second baseman in history. Babe Ruth's legendary teammate, Lou Gehrig, the Iron Horse, 340 career average, 493 home runs, only five RBI short of 2,000, which is still seventh all time, and he won six World Series with the Yankees, twice an MVP, and the first player to have his uniform number retired. Babe Ruth is called, or excuse me, Lou Gehrig is called the Iron Horse because he played in 2,130 consecutive games, which is a record that stood for 56 years until Cal Ripken Jr. broke it. Lou Gehrig was always in the shadow of Babe Ruth, and I think he liked it that way. Babe Ruth loved the spotlight. Babe Ruth loved the media attention, and Lou Gehrig did not. He was much quieter, much more humble, uh, liked to stay kind of out of the spotlight and let his playing do the talking. And uh, he and Babe were close friends at times and then had some falling outs and then were close friends again at the end. Uh, Lou Gehrig is one of the great tragic stories as well in, in Major League history. Uh, he was only 37 years old when he died of 
amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and now it's often called Lou Gehrig's disease because he was the most famous person uh, to have that disease that we knew of and, and die from it. What happened was he was he still had a handful of, of years ahead of him, he thought, to play and, and be productive for the Yankees. But as a new season was, was starting, uh, he all of a sudden in spring training lost some of his hand-eye coordination. He was slow. He was he was stumbling as he tried to run. He uh, he wasn't reacting, uh, and re his reflexes weren't the same as they had been. And it was almost overnight that this had happened. Uh, he was, I believe, he was 36 at the time, and uh, he went to the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, which was probably the leading uh, clinic for this type of thing. Uh, in the United States, certainly at the time, and they diagnosed him with ALS. ALS is a nasty disease. It eats away at your body. Uh, your body becomes uh, just a shell of what it of what it uh, was, and most people die fairly quickly of ALS. Not everyone. Some people linger and and hang on for a long time, and it's it's a horrible way to suffer. Yeah, but uh, Lou Gehrig, uh, his career was over at that point, and uh, a year or so later, year and a half, two years later, he passed away of Lou Gehrig's disease. He still goes down as one of the great heroes in all of baseball history. His positive attitude and his perseverance, his courage through all of what he went through at the end of his life uh, to this day remains an inspiration for people everywhere. And you can see the Lou Gehrig Memorial Award is given every year to the major league player uh, that exhibits great integrity and character. Lou Gehrig is the true definition of a hero. Jimmy Fox, double X, the beast. You can see his 534 career home runs were next only to Babe Ruth. Uh, his 1922 career RBI are still 10th all time. And you can see he won the MVP in the American League in back to back seasons in 1932 and 33 with just amazing statistics, super high batting averages, home runs, uh, 58 homers in 32, 48 homers in 33, uh, 169 RBI in 32, 163 RBI in 33. These were just incredible seasons. And then in that 1933 year, he won the Triple Crown as well. He was three times the MVP, uh, 32, 33, and the 1938. And he played for both the Boston Red Sox and the Philadelphia Athletics. And he helped the A's win two World Series. In fact, back-to-back -back years in 1929 and 1930. Oftentimes overlooked because of Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. Uh, but... Uh, during that era, Jimmy Fox was one of the most feared and dominant offensive threats in the game. Mel Ott is one of the great power hitters of all time, and at only five foot nine and 170 pounds, no one could figure out how he was doing it. Uh, not a big guy, but the first National League player to hit more than 500 home runs in his career. Career 304 average. And you can see his, his uh, 1,860 RBI and 1,859 runs scored, just one less than his RBI. Uh, first National League player to have eight consecutive 100-plus RBI seasons and helped the Giants, the New York Giants, win the World Series in 1933. Mel Ott is truly one of the great hitters of his era and of all time, and especially for his stature, was, uh, talk about incredible power, that was amazing. The Heater from Van Meter. Bob Feller was from a little town in Iowa. He started playing in the major leagues at the age of 17. Right out of high school, he bypassed the minor leagues completely. But now this is the time when we are going to look at a few players that missed some of their great years, some of the, sometimes their 
prime years uh, to serve their nation in World War II. He served for four years in the Navy during the Second World War. And, uh, but his career statistics in the major leagues are incredible. Uh, with 266 wins, he certainly would have had well over 300 had he not uh, served that time in World War II. But 325 uh, ERA, which is excellent for a career ERA, he was uh, a strikeout machine. He helped the Cleveland Indians win their last World Series title in 1948. He won the, the American League Pitcher's Triple Crown in 1940 um, before his service in World War II. And so you can see he was off to uh, just an amazing start as just a young man. Uh, three career no-hitters, six times he led the American League in wins, seven times in strikeouts. And Ted Williams called Bob Feller the fastest and best pitcher I ever saw during my career. Feller's fastball would hit around 100 miles an hour. And at, uh, in 1946, just after World War II, at Griffith Stadium in Washington, D.C., one of his pitches was clocked at 107.6 miles an hour, which is the second fastest officially recorded pitch ever. Uh, Bob Feller was feared by hitters. You can see why. Uh, dominating fastball, excellent curveball, and he was the ultimate competitor on the mound. Jolton Joe DiMaggio. One of the most loved players, one of the greatest players of all time. Played for 13 years. He also served in the military from 1950, excuse me, 1943 to 1945 uh, during his prime. Uh, the Yankee Clipper, as he's sometimes called, or Jolton Joe, has a record that people will be hard-pressed to break. 56-game hitting streak in 1941. 56 games in a row where he reached base successfully uh, via a base hit. Keep in mind, during a hitting streak, if, uh, if the other team commits an error and you get on base, that does not count as a hit. So if you're 0 for 3 and you get up the fourth time and the other team commits an error, but you get on base, that, that breaks your hitting streak. It's not a base hit. If they walk you every time you come up, that breaks your streak. So... To have a hit in 56 straight games is unbelievable. Uh, you can see his career batting average was amazing at 325. He was he, he also had a lot of power, with over 300 and uh, well 361 to be exact career home runs. His 1537 RBI and 2214 2, hits also amazing statistics. He helped the Yankees win nine World Series, and this is the. The Yankees were great in the 20s with Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. They were great in the 30s and into the 40s with Joe DiMaggio. Um, Three-time American League MVP. And you can see he had four 30-plus home run and 100-plus RBI seasons in his first five years. So he took the league by storm right away. Of course, his number five jersey is retired by the Yankees. And uh, he... Also was the well after Babe Ruth was really the next massive contract groundbreaking contract player in Major League Baseball. In 1949, he signed a, a record $100,000 a year contract. No player had ever made that much money. We look at that today and we we see players making $30 million a year, and uh, that 100,000 doesn't look so great, but but it, for that era, it was the most of any player. And he was famously married to Marilyn, Mon Marilyn Monroe as well. That lasted uh, just less than a year, but uh, reports are that uh, even though they split up, he loved her uh, until his dying day. Joe DiMaggio, center fielder for the Yankees, baseball icon and kid's hero. The player with just about as many nicknames as Babe Ruth, probably a close second to Babe Ruth, is Ted Williams. Ted Williams, the kid, the splendid splinter, Teddy Ballgame, the thumper, and the greatest hitter who ever lived. He just might be the greatest hitter who ever lived. Ted Williams had a career that was fascinating, electric, 
uh, and interrupted by war, not just once, but twice. You can see his 344 career batting average is tied for seventh all time. Over 500 career home runs. His career 482 on base percentage is the highest of all time. He had one of the great eyes of all time at the plate, one of the great swings, power, average, he could do it all. Two time American League MVP, both after, the, after World War II. Uh, and before, as we will see, his entrance into the Korean War. He was also a two-time Triple Crown winner, leading the league in home runs, RBI, and batting average. Once uh, before his service in the war and once uh, after World War II. Six-time batting champion, four-time home run champion, four-time RBI champion. He, like I said, though, had his career interrupted twice by war, he was a naval aviator during World War II. He flew planes for the U.S. Navy, and he was a fighter pilot. And you can see from 1942 to 46, he was in the Navy. And then when the Korean War broke out, uh, he eventually got in, he went back and became another fighter pilot again from 1952 to 53. He was not only one of the greatest baseball players and hitters of all time, the U.S. Navy still considers him to be one of the great fighter pilots they've ever had. Uh, his supreme and superior hand-eye coordination helped him in, in the cockpit to become one of the great fighter pilots that we've seen. So, you know, during World War II, some of the great baseball players were given kind of uh, cush jobs in, in the military. Some of them were, were kept off the front lines and, and, you know, they were kind of, they used their celebrity uh, in other ways, but some of the ball players went to the front lines and they fought full on and they were right there in the thick of the battle and Ted Williams was one of them. Even though he missed those seasons during his career, uh, you can see his statistics are still amazing off the charts. Imagine what they would have been with all those other years that uh, he missed. But uh, just give you an example, Ted Williams, his eye was so good at the plate. During batting practice, there's a great story about one day they decided to um, take baseballs, take like five baseballs, and on one of them they put, they would with a marker put one, and the next one they put a two, next one a three, and so forth. And then the batting practice pitcher would throw the ball, and Ted Williams could see the number on the ball. His eyes were so good, and he would call out the number and then hit the ball. Uh, that's just unbelievable. So Ted Williams, the Splendid Splinter, is probably his most famous nickname. That's how I grew up knowing him. Um, that's how that's what my dad would call him, and uh, absolutely one of the one of the supreme elite hitters of all time. He did have oftentimes a rocky relationship with the Boston fan base. Of course, they couldn't deny his amazing abilities, but uh, he would never tip his cap to them as he hit home runs or. He just uh, he kind of wanted to stay away from, from the media and had kind of a, a thorny relationship with the media. Unfortunately for Williams, he never won a World Series. The Red Sox were usually not very good uh, when, he, when, when he was leading their team. He was the star, but they weren't always a very good team. But uh, his abilities can never be doubted. Crazy enough, but perhaps one of the most underrated players in history is Stan the, Stan the Man, Stan Musial. Played for the St. Louis Cardinals, and you can see his career batting average of 331. He's fourth all time in career hits, 475 home runs, 1,951 RBI, which is eighth all time. He's 10th all time in career runs scored with 1,949. Third all-time in doubles behind only Trish Speaker and Pete Rose. He's second all-time in career total bases, next only to Hank Aaron. Three-time National League MVP, three World Series championships with the Cardinals, 42, 44, and 46. He did miss the 1945 season to serve in the Navy during World War II. He did not miss uh, multiple seasons like a lot of the stars from that era did, but he was still 
he, he did miss a season uh, to serve in the Navy. Seven batting championships in the National League and tied for most all-star games of all time uh, with Hank Aaron and Willie Mays. He's, he played in 24 of them. Uh, there were a few years where they had two all-star games each season. Kind of interesting, but there were a few years like that, and he, he of course, got voted uh, to the all-star game every time. So inducted to the Hall of Fame in 1969, his number six jersey is retired by the St. Louis Cardinals. One of the great hitters. You can see he, he's up there in all these offensive categories. Top 10, top five, top two or three in a lot of them. He is an amazing player, uh, but ironically, somewhat overlooked during that era because of the likes of Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams and, and so forth. But wow, what a player Stan Musial was. And Warren Spahn ironically, kind of overlooked himself as a pitcher. Of course, not overlooked by the, the batters that he faced. They were, uh, they they definitely respected Warren Spahn. They knew he was one of the greats of all time. Uh, but he does his name doesn't get brought up all the time when we talk about the all-time legends on the mound. He's sixth all-time in wins with 363, which are the most all-time by a left-hander and more than any other pitcher who played their entire career in the post-1920 live ball era. His 3.09 ERA is amazing, over 2,500 career strikeouts. Uh, even when he was 42 years old, he had a 23-7 and record, so he was awesome throughout his career. He helped the Braves win a title in 1957, and that same year he won the Cy Young Award. Uh, he his philosophy on pitching was always which is to me is perfect a perfect philosophy he always said hitting is timing and pitching is upsetting timing and that's really what it is and warren spawn did it masterfully 